The following message is from Grace on the Ashley Baptist Church, located in Charleston, South Carolina. For more information about Grace on the Ashley, visit graceontheashley.org. We praise you, Father, this day that we have a gospel to proclaim. That there's good news for us to take beyond this place. That you're holy. Above all things, you're holy. That you loved with such a great, great love. You sent your son to die on a cross as our substitute. So we wouldn't have to that we might have life, not death. And it's all by your grace, by your grace so undeserved. It's by your mercy as well that we don't get what we deserve. So this day we praise you with our voices and with our hearts for the gift of grace. Make us, Lord, a church, as a church, as, as your children, as your people, as the elect, as your called out ones. Lord, make us committed to go and make thee known, as we just sang. Forgive us for being the sleepy cowards we just sang about, when, especially when it comes to Sharing such good news. And send us. Send us first to our knees. Praying for forgiveness, for for strength. And then beyond this place. That we get up and go. Fulfill in us the great commission for your glory and your glory alone, O oh Lord. And we love you and praise you and adore your name. We give you what is ours that you've blessed us with. That you might use our gifts and our talents and our abilities for kingdom purposes. And you've put us here to gather your church. We thank you for your church. We might gather and worship here today. A variety of people with a variety of needs and cares in our lives, Lord. We pray that you'll take care of today, that you'll Minister by your word, by the power of your spirit in our lives. Do a work in us today. Do a work in each of us today for your glory and for our good. We not only thank you for your church, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd empower Greg as he delivers the message that you have given him for our ears and for our hearts. Open our hearts to these truths this day. We thank you that we can entrust to you the work that needs to be done in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you guys take your scripture, go with me to Romans 13. We're going to be in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And as we get there, I want to thank the pastors and the elders for allowing me to preach. You know, we have two pastors that take God's word seriously. They take it seriously in the way that they teach it to us and preach it to us. They take it seriously in the way that they live it out before us. And so anytime a pastor gives up their pulpit to someone else, and they care about the word, you see that as an honor. And so I feel that honor this morning. Thank you guys for that honor. 
Also, if you were here last week, Pastor Greg said that there is this time requirement, like there's a window that I'm working with here. Do you remember that? So at 30 minutes or less, you feel shortchanged, but like there's an hour and 10 where you feel angry. So I'm working, I'm just, and there's no clock in here, right? This, is, this can be really dangerous. So I've prepared two hours worth of material, and we'll just see how this goes. The, the, the children's workers will kill me, I'm sure of it. Um, so Greg gave you a flyby of who I am, and out of all of that, one of the most important things for you to know is that I'm one of you. So I'm a member here at Grace on the Ashley. Uh, I point that out to you because this morning I don't appeal to you based off of a position of authority because I'm one of you. I'm a fellow member here. The reason I point that out is because the authority that I come to you with is God's authority through his word. And so the point that Greg oversteps that boundary I have lost all authority over you, right? You, like the kids say, you're not the boss of me. So my goal is that to keep one finger on the text as I preach this morning, and in doing so, I hope that God will be honored through this process. This morning's title is Politics and the Purposes of God. You know, we are in a season of political frenzy, are we not? Most of you know that today is sandwiched between South Carolina primaries. So yesterday we had the Republican primaries and then next Saturday we will have the Democratic primaries. You also know that certain candidates have been all over our neighborhood, right? Beaufort, Charleston, Bluffton, Greensboro. It's a very politically charged season and I think as this next weekend comes, it's gonna stay that way. You can't open a newspaper, you can't read the television right now without seeing some type of political reference from the Pope's condemnation of one gentleman to Supreme Court justice passing away and what that's gonna look like for the future. We really have this saturation right now and I think it's gonna continue until November of this year where politics are everywhere. And I think this will continue to be a very formative year for our country. Just yesterday, we were downtown, and there was a rally for one of the political candidates. Everyone was cheering. Everyone was hoorahing. And I thought, oh, great, we have a few more months of this. So naturally, we get steeped into these discussions, and sometimes we lose perspective of God's purposes. What's he doing in the middle of this frenzy? So this morning, that's where we're going. I don't want us to get pulled into talk about candidates I don't want us to get pulled into talk about political parties or the ramifications of our votes this year or the direction of our country. That's not my goal. My goal is not to rattle you as to the future of America. My goal is not to lobby for a vote. My goal is to help teach you God's word as it applies to politics and then help situate a response from you towards those governing authorities or towards those politics. So I think one of the clearest questions on how you get there is you, you think of this question, how would God have us to think about government and the authorities that represent that government? Have you asked yourself among all of the news, among all the papers that you've read, how would God have us to think about government and the authorities that represent that government? It, it may come as a surprise to you that God directly speaks into that, that politics are something that he takes up clearly. There are three primary passages that he does this with. 1 Peter chapter 2. Pastor Greg was reading from 1 Peter last week. We have Titus chapter 3. And then I think probably the clearest articulation is here in Romans 13. And this is a passage that was also set in the middle of a politically frenzied time. So let me give you a little bit of context before we read verses 1 through 7. So Paul was writing to a city that he had not yet been to. He had goals of going to this city. Chapter 1, verse 13 says he wanted to come to them. Chapter 15, he says, I want to kind of hit you guys and route to Spain. He did go there ultimately, and I'll cover that here in a second. But it wasn't like he had originally planned. It's guessed that he wrote this from Corinth around AD 55. And that's not important to remember the date. But the reason I mention that is because around this time, Nero would have been the emperor So Nero Nero would have been one of the governing authorities to which Paul was referring here. In fact, it's believed that Paul would ultimately go to Rome where he would be killed under the governing authorities that he's preparing to write these words to. So pick up with me in verse number one. Let's read verses one through seven. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. 
and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Hallelujah, we pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Verse number seven, last verse. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. You know, Paul begins this section, and he's really flowing from 11 chapters of dense theology. And then at the beginning of chapter 12, he starts to connect the Christian's walk with God. So presenting yourself as members, not being conformed, but being transformed. And then he spends the next 18 or so verses of chapter 12 talking about how do we interact with each other? How do you use your gifts in the body? How do you let Christian love be genuine and manifested? Then naturally it segues into the last verse he mentions in verse number 12. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's gonna be important for you to catch. The last part of chapter 12 introduces the first part of chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There are two groups of people that he starts with here if you look in verse number one. You have every person and you have governing authorities. What's interesting is that he makes no distinction for the Christian citizen as you read this. He doesn't footnote the command. He doesn't provide a clarification here. He simply says every person. So this has international applicability, if that's a word. This applies everywhere. No matter at what point or under what government you are, this is applicable to you and to me. Some believe that he was writing this to a a Jewish group of Romans who would revolt against any type of foreign leadership. So the Jews' perspective is that we're not recognizing them as authorities over us. Why? Because they're not Jewish. We don't know. We don't know exactly why Paul writes to them and says, every person among you but we know that he's writing to include everyone. So when the Romans would have heard this, there would have been no question that this applied to them and this applied to their context. So he starts out, every person, next group, governing authorities. So just like the every person, he doesn't provide a clarification for governing authorities. Isn't that interesting? So Paul knows that there are different types of governing authorities. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Timothy 2, he differentiates, he says, between kings and between those in high places. In Titus, he says, between rulers and between authorities. But here he just says, governing authorities. Every person, governing authorities, his intention is not to draw distinctions, but to include everyone. So every person and every governing authority. So if you were to ask the question or if they were to ask the question in this time, to which governing authority do I submit? Well, the natural implication was all of them. You submit to all of them. Well, who does this apply to? Well, all of you. It applies to all of you. So the link between every person and the link between governing authorities is this command to be subject Two types of people are linked by this subjection, one to the other. Look in verse number one again with me. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And this is where he's gonna spend the next six verses, fleshing out what that subjection looks like. He will spend the next six verses substantiating why he says that and what that looks like. So this brings us to the first point of this morning. The sovereignty of God establishes governments and their authorities. Look at the next part of verse number one with me. It says, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. You know, Paul is answering this understood question of why would I submit to you? Why would I submit to them? 
So after giving this command, he begins to explain, why would you do that? Why in the world would you submit to a governing authority, even the great ones or even the not so great ones? And he uses this idea that twice in this verse, there is no authority that exists outside of God's allowance of their existence. Why do you submit? Because there is no authority except from God. That's the negative way of saying it. Then he says it positively. And those that exist have been instituted by God. It's interesting to me that he doesn't start with the benefits of society. And there are huge benefits of society when we submit to government. He doesn't start with the benefits to you, what the particular benefits would be to you or the dangers of what anarchy might look like. He doesn't even go to the fact that, well, you know, they have some really good guys that are leading us. They've done this before. They know what they're doing. I've never led anyone or any country, so let's trust them. He doesn't go to any of those He starts with the fact that God has put these leaders in their place. This is the central reason that subjection is possible. It's almost like in spite of who those governing authorities are, the call is to be in subjection to them. So verse number two, he says, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And in verse number four, he says, For he is God's steward, excuse me, he is God's servant for your good. Listen to the words of Leon Morris. He said this, he said, Paul's view is distinctive. He is firmly convinced that God is in control and that nobody secures a position of rulership unless God permits. Ordered government is not a human device, but something of divine origin. You know, all authority finds its origin in God. Every government that exists, exists from God. This is a hard truth that we're gonna spend a few minutes talking through. I want you to think back with me. You don't have to turn there. I want you to think back to Daniel. I want you to think back to the time when Daniel was snatched from his country as a kid and he was forced to serve in a secular government. More than that, I want you to think it's time when the secular king has a vision and he wants someone to tell him what it means and no one can figure it out. They bring all the wise men of Babylon in and none of these guys get it. So the king gets angry and he says, kill them all. I'm done with them. And then God does something gracious. He reveals that dream to Daniel. You remember that? So this is like an oasis. We think we're gonna die. We have a death sentence. No one knows what this means. A dream comes to Daniel and he knows. And this is how Daniel responds and prays to God. This is chapter two, verse 21 of Daniel. It says, he, referring to God, changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Do you you see that middle part? He removes kings and sets up kings. This is written by a guy who is just being prepared to go to execution by his king. And he says, God sets up kings. God removes kings. Daniel, a man who was kidnapped in his use and he was forced to serve this secular nation. He gets that God is the one who ultimately sets up kings and removes kings. He knew that the sovereignty of God establishes governing authorities. So scripture just doesn't stop there. It says that God both establishes those governing authorities and that God rules over those governing authorities. Listen to the words of Proverbs 21 verse 1. It says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Don't you love that? In this time, someone just couldn't go to a faucet and turn it on and water your yard, right? Sprinklers weren't a thing yet. So what they would have to do is they would have to channel water in order to get it to the places they needed it. So the writer of Proverbs here describes that that's what a king's heart is like in God's hand, that he moves it, he takes it wherever he wants it to go. Psalm 135 verse six says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. The sovereignty of God establishes governing authorities. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 19. This one is important for you to get. There is perhaps no better illustration of this fact than John chapter 19. So as you're turning there, we're gonna pick up in verse number seven. Let me just paint a little bit of the background here. 
First of all, Pilate was the procurator during this time. And as procurator, he had a few privileges. First of all, was that he had full powers of life and death. So within his reign, he had kind of the keys to life and death. And we'll see him mention that here in a second. But more than that, he had the ability to reverse capital punishment punishment sentences. So when the Sanhedrin come to him and say, hey, we need you to do this, he could say, no, I'm not going to do that. I won't ratify what you want me to do. So Jesus has been brought to Pilate after a shoddy trial before Caiaphas. Pilate has already beat him, done his investigations. I don't find any fault with this man. They say, no, no, beating him's not going to be enough. We need more. We want blood. We want his life. So he capitulates to their desire. Look in verse number seven with me. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he'd made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He had already had kind of the spooks about him. So he heard this, there's something not right about this. Verse number nine, he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? It's kind of like this idea, like truly, where are you from? And listen how Jesus responds. He didn't give him an answer. So read verse 10 with me. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? That's that's just kind of a way of saying, you're not gonna listen to me? You're not gonna talk to me right now? Here's the next question that he says. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? You see that? Pilate at this point thinks that he is the final authority. And for all intensive purposes, from an earthly perspective, he is. Why are you ignoring me? I have the power to take your life. That's what he's saying. And listen to the way that Jesus replied to this claim for authority. Verse 11. He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Whoa. You feel that? Whoa. Whoa. You don't have any authority. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. I love the boldness that Jesus uses here. Jesus reminds Pilate of his place in this world as important as he may think it is. The authority you think you have, you only have it because God, my Father, has given it to you. I think if I were to say that, it would come across very rude, kind of like, nah, nah, my dad's bigger than your dad. But Jesus confronts him. He says, you don't have the authority you think you do. And I want to remind you that this is a secular, godless leader. We have nothing that says Pilate was a Christian or that he somehow converted later in life. And I also want to point out to you that the same word for authority that's used here in John's narrative is the same word that's used in Romans 13. There's no authority except from God. And those that have been instituted have been instituted by God. So I want to give you an illustration. You know, uh, Greg mentioned this in passing. I was in uh, the army for almost five years. And the majority of those years were served in South Korea. And if you keep abreast to the Korean peninsula, it's very volatile. All the time it's volatile. And I had the privilege of being stationed right in between the two countries. In a little camp, it was a United Nations camp called Camp Boniface. So literally, if we were to go 10 minutes, we would be in North Korea. No joke. We are, are, um, we called it our headquarters at that point. It was 10 minutes from the North Korean border. Just a wicked, wicked government. A government that starves its people. A government that takes from the poor and gives to the rich. A government that knows nothing of justice. And so occasionally, we would have the privilege to get to go south, is the way we worded it then, which is basically to go down to Seoul or go to one of the other cities. And that means that if the weekend came, I would go down and I would go to church. So naturally, um, we would pray for different governing things at that time. And we were in Bible study one time. It was a Friday night. And one of our Korean brothers, he's a pastor in the area. He said, I'm not praying for that nation, referring to North Korea, because they are not a nation that's been established by God. What he was saying is that their corruptness was an example of their rogueness. The fact that they weren't submitting to anyone but themselves was an example that they were not established by God. Therefore, there was no type of prayer. There was no type of submission that he thought would be warranted towards them. I agree in the fact that 
They are a corrupt nation. I agree in the fact that it is dangerous for the citizens of that nation and the governing authorities make it dangerous. But I disagree because Romans 13 says that those that exist have been instituted by God, even the corrupt ones. God is exercising his sovereignty over the bad guys, so to speak. That's very comforting to us and I'll explain more why here in a minute. The sovereignty of God establishes governments and their authorities, even the not so great ones. So this leads us to our next point. Our first point is that the sovereignty of God establishes governments. My second point, and if you put it up on the screen here, it's the sovereignty of God frees us to radical submission to governing authorities. You know, the whole reason that Paul states that God has set up governing authorities and that there is no authority except from what God has set up, the whole reason he says that is the first part of the verse in verse one, be subject to them. It's a phrase that he and Peter repeat in every instance where our relationship to the government is referred to. Titus 3, 1 Peter 2. It literally means to put yourself under their authority, to be subject to. The way I think of it is umbrellas. Think of yourself in the rain. No one has to go to you and say, hey, hey, come, come get under under this umbrella so you can be protected. The way that we subject ourselves is that no one is forcing us into this. You haven't cornered me and I have no choice. Now I'm going to submit to your authority. That's not subjection. That's you had no other choice. It's not the fact that you've somehow pinned me down and I'm now going to be subject to you. The idea is place yourself under the authority of others. So bring up on the slides here, bring up the umbrellas. So I want you to think of it like this. So clearly... We have an overarching umbrella of God's authority in our life. It's inescapable. That's the point of this passage, that even the sub-authorities, the governments, they submit to a larger authority, and they will submit to a larger authority, who is God. But second, we have governments. So those governments are governments under authority, even if they don't recognize that authority. An example, Pilate. And then lastly, we have ourselves. So I'm to place myself under the authority of both God and man. In almost every place in the New Testament, this is mentioned. Listen to the words of Titus 3, verse 1. It says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Did you catch that? Submissive to rulers and authorities. Same idea. Peter says the same thing, verse 13 of chapter 2. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. The sovereignty of God over these authorities, it frees us for submission to those authorities. That's the point of this passage. Why? Why does it do that? Because it's not about those authorities. It's not about how awesome they are or how much they represent my mindset or how they will protect my rights. I submit and we submit to governing authorities because we know that God is the final authority. The same thing that Jesus told Pilate. You would have no authority except God gave it to you. We want God to be pleased, so we submit. We want God to be honored, so we put ourselves in subjection to. But I use the term radical here, and why do I say that? We could just say subject. Why do I say radical submission? Because radical submission takes place under harsh governments. It takes place where it's difficult to do that. It takes place where there is corruption. Oh, how I wish that this only applied to godly governments where we could say, no, you don't represent us well, so we don't submit to you. The reason that Paul is writing is he's wanting to see that every governing authority, every person, put yourself in subjection to them. You know, you can't look at the Old Testament without seeing examples of people who are under corrupt governments and they place themselves in submission to them. Think of the icons. Think of Joseph. 
Joseph, betrayed by family, sold against his will, imprisoned two or three times, governing authority's wife lies about him, prison again. God uses all of that to preserve a nation. The corruptness of his time, the sins that were imposed against him, God used that. So much so that at the end of it all, he says to his brothers, you know what, you guys, you meant that for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Think of Daniel, I've referred to him already just in passing. Daniel was literally kidnapped as a teenager, taken away, maybe never to see his family again. The Babylonians weren't really in touch with family reunions at that point. He was gone. Not only was he gone, but as a teenager, he was automatically pushed into eat this, worship this, learn this, the secular environment. This was a king who would tell him he couldn't pray because he was tricked into it. He would throw him into a lion's den. He would take his friends and he threw them into the fiery furnace. Do you remember that? And how did both Joseph and Daniel continuously respond to these? They submitted. They placed themselves under the authorities. They didn't go out and start a militia. There was no Indian uprising, so to speak. They placed themselves under the submission of these wicked and corrupt governments, and God used that. If you just briefly studied the interaction of Nero with the Christians of the first century, you would see that it was not positive. It wasn't just. They did not have a good relationship. It was brutal. It was unjust. It was corrupt. And yet Peter doesn't tell the persecuted believers to whom he writes, he doesn't tell them, you know what, Submit to everyone but him. Submission is the call. Subjection is the call, even to the unjust government. So why do we have to see it as radical submission? Because it's hard. Governing authorities are not God-honoring at times. They don't have our best interests in mind. They overtax. They keep it for themselves. That happens. And God's call on the Christian is submission. You know, at the epicenter of the Christian faith is a corrupt government that crucified its savior. And how did Christ respond to that? He had the power to end it, end it. And he placed himself in subjection to the governing authorities of that time. Maybe you feel this. Maybe you feel this in our nation. Maybe you feel the not so greatness. Can we just put it mildly like that? Maybe you feel that. What's God calling you to do? Subjection. Listen to the words of John MacArthur. I have this on the screen for you. It's a bit lengthy, so bear with me for a second. Many evangelicals strongly believe that the American Revolution was wholly justified, not only politically, but biblically. They believe that life Liberty and the pursuit of happiness not only are divinely endowed, but that their attainment and defense is Christian and thereby justified at whatever cost. It's like, okay, John, you're getting close. Don't go there, man. We know where he's going. Don't go there, John. Including that of armed rebellion when necessary. Obviously, such action is forbidden by God and judged in light of our present text, referring to Romans 13, It is equally obvious that the United States was born out of a violation to Scripture. Okay, don't storm the stage, right? This is why you quote other people. You know, he said it. You know, my goal is not to incite how did our nation begin. My goal is to show you something, that God calls us towards radical submission, even under wicked governments. The sovereignty of God frees us to that. That even though our justice may not come in this lifetime, it will come because he's avenger. So I do good. We know that he is ultimate authority. So I submit. Whether you're awesome or whether you're not awesome. I want you to catch this part. And only when obedience to our government would equal disobedience to God do we refuse to submit? Acts 5, 29. Let me say that again. 
Only when obedience to our government would equal disobedience to God do we refuse to submit. Our goal as Christians is to obey both God and man. We don't have to create this false juxtaposition of either God or man. Our goal is to obey, to be in subjection to our governing authorities and God, our Father, who is the ultimate authority. And in America, this is not extraordinarily difficult. I've never been commanded to do something that would be against God's will by the governing authorities. Never, not once. The sovereignty of God frees us for radical submission. And this radical submission, this is my third point, it overflows into good works. In the middle of this supercharged political year, I want you to see something. And I want to give you a statement. I want you to fill in the blank of this statement. Don't answer it out loud. I don't want you to taint your neighbor's opinion. So go ahead and put that statement up on the PowerPoint for us. God's will for Christian citizens of human governments is that they be what? Don't answer this out loud, okay? I want you to be thinking this to yourself. How do you answer that question? God's will for Christian citizens of human governments is that they be, I think, we default to the idea of free. Maybe that's where your mind goes. God has called us to be free. Maybe protected. We need court systems. We need godly Supreme Court justices. We need police. Maybe us Southerners think armed. Right? I'm a Southerner too. I can pick on you. God wants us to fulfill our rights. Don't take away our guns. Yet scripture repeatedly tells us that God wants us to be holy. Were you here last week when Pastor Greg said, God's will for you is your sanctification. That's it. God wants you to be holy. God's will is not our political independence only. It's that we are holy. If you and I were to hop on a plane, we were to ride over to the airport, cruise to Iran, hop off the plane, we would lose a lot of liberties, would we not? But in losing those liberties, we could increase in holiness. God has called us to be holy people, holy citizens as Christians. His will for us is that we be holy. And that doesn't just apply here in America. It applies wherever we go. So let me connect one more dot for you. Don't miss this. God uses governing authorities for the sanctification of his people, including governing authorities that are not that great. Let me just fill in a a bit more of the details for 1 Peter. 1 Peter was written to people who were in the middle of fierce persecution. I've told this to you already. It was a trial. Peter is writing to them to encourage them. How do you respond in this trial? But one of the things that's important for you to note is that the trial was a trial created by their government. Nero is believed to have blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, and now they are hated by everyone. No one likes them. Who started that? Their governing authority started that. So verse number one of his first epistle to them, he says this. Chapter one, verse seven, excuse me. And this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, trials that your government created for you. You see that? Why do you rejoice in those trials your government created for you? Look at verse, the next verse seven here. Those so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise, and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The trials that your government created can result in praise and glory and honor when Christ comes back. You feel that? You feel the implications of what that means? Your government started all of this, but this can work for your good when Christ comes back. Governments can create trials that are intended to cultivate holiness in us by God. So how does that holiness come to fruition? How does it work its way out? I want you to go back to Romans 13 if you're not already there. 
Radical submission overflows into good works towards those governing authorities. Good conduct, good. We're gonna see that. Go back to verse number two. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Paul mentions twice here that the overflow of subjection to governing authorities is good conduct. Verse number three, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct. So do what's good. Most of us are not in a government right now that is a terror to us. That's not the world in which we live. Yet you have to take this one step further. Radical submission means that, that I should be doing good. I should be about good works towards governing authorities. Listen to the words of Titus 3.1 again. It says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities and to be obedient. You've heard that already, but here's what you haven't heard. He says this, he says, to be ready for every good work. You see that? Paul tells Titus the same thing as he mentions in Romans 13. Now catch one more theme. 1 Peter chapter 2. Guess what Peter tells them? Verse number 15. This is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see that again? What are the odds? Two writers, two books, three contexts. Isn't it interesting that the three dominant passages that describe our relationship to government have subjection and good conduct in them? Doing good is vitally connected to our earthly citizenship. Furthermore, I want to remind you of something that I mentioned just in passing. Romans 13 is born out of Romans 12, which says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what, church? With good. Do good. Do good. Your submission towards governing authorities should work its way out into good conduct before those governing authorities. There should be no rebelliousness. There should be no disrespect or dishonor. So the question now comes, what would God have us to do? What does that good conduct look like? You know, I've gone to each of these passages, the three primaries that we've addressed in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I've tried to pull from them all of the aspects of good conduct that they have mentioned. I could probably give more if I were to make some more up, but I just wanted to take exactly what the scripture said, consolidate it, and present it to you. What does good conduct look like? What does our citizenship look like? Well, the first, of course, is submission to that. We've spent so much time on this. I don't want to miss it, but I don't want you to forget that you cannot do good conduct without being submissive to your governing authorities. Those are incongruent, if you're wondering. The second is prayer. If you're taking notes, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, Paul tells Timothy something very interesting. He says, I want prayer to be lifted up for all people everywhere, for kings in high places for governing authorities, the clarification church. This isn't just like we pray that the gnats of a thousand camels would come towards this person, right? That's not the idea. The prayer is for good, for God's glory, for wisdom. The first aspect of good conduct is that we are to be praying for the leaders that God has appointed over us. Not imprecatory prayers of God hurt them. God be with them. They need wisdom. You know, when's the last time that the news has prompted you towards prayer? When's the last time Fox News just really brought out the prayer life in you? We must be a people who are prayerful for the leaders of our government. Secondly, and you're gonna love this one, maybe third, depends on how you count these, paying taxes. It's that season, isn't it? 
Paying taxes. Glorious. April 15th is coming. Verse 7 of Romans 13 says, Pay to all what is owed, taxes to whom taxes is owed. Jesus said the same thing. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. There are a few other verses that mention this. Tax paying is part of our good conduct. And he didn't put an addendum on what if they misuse it. He said, pay your taxes. Submit to your government. Part of our good conduct as we situate this in 2016 is that we pay our taxes. Not because we love it. But because we submit to the governing authorities that are over us. And they will be held account to how they use it. So we have prayer. We have paying taxes. And the next we have honor. Honor. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17 and Romans 13 both tell us to do such. Give honor to the governing authorities. Not only when they're being honorable. Honor the authorities in your actions. Let's make this a bit more practical. Honor the authorities in the way that you interact with other coworkers when you talk about them. Honor authorities and what you post to your Facebook account. Honor authorities and the way that you represent them, their beliefs, their positions on things. Honor them because that's what God has called you to do, even if they are not honorable people. The last manifestation of good works is respect. And I think this is perhaps a twin sister of honor. But Romans 13 differentiates It says, respect your authorities. Literally, this word could be translated as fear. Have huge respect for the authorities that are over you. Not that you are afraid of them, but that you have this this deference. Like, I greatly honor and respect those authorities. That's the idea that he's wanting them to catch here. Respect them. Not just when you see them. Respect them in the way you talk about them. Respect the way that you represent them and their beliefs, even the ones you don't like. Respect them because God has called us to do such and to do otherwise would be against God's plan. So how does good conduct manifest itself? It does it in submission, in prayer, paying taxes, in honor, and in respect. As we close, I want you to go to Psalm 146. You know, in the political frenzy of our day, God has purposes for us as his people. I hope you see that. His purposes may not be exactly what you wanted. He's not absent and he's not ignorant that last night, South Carolina primaries came to fruition. He's not ignorant of the fact that this year is election year in America. One of the most liberating thoughts for us as Christians is that God is sovereignly over our governing authorities and that he's in the middle of establishing those authorities right now in South Carolina, right now. Even the authorities that are not so great. I said that if you only get one thing from today's message, I wanted you to get this. He has purposes for you as a citizen of this government and it's that you are holy And you may lose a little bit of liberties here and there, but his goal is not ultimately that you be politically free. It's ultimately that you be holy and like Christ. A holiness that manifests itself in doing good as an earthly citizen. Radical submission overflows in good works toward governing authorities. You can't separate the two. You can't do good and be unsubmissive. It's not possible. So look at Psalm 146 with me. Let's finish this with ideally a way of bolstering our confidence in God. Verse number three. Put not your trust in princes, a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your hope in princes. Don't put your hope in political leaders, guys. When they die, so do their plans. 
Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God. Verse six, the God who has made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Verse seven, who executes justice for the oppressed and who gives food to the hungry. Now I want you to skip down to verse number 10. This is our battle cry. This is why we submit. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray to him. God, I I think if we are candid, we are not always enthused about the direction of our government, about those who may lead us. I pray that you would situate Grace on the Ashley, that you would situate us among all of the political frenzy, the craziness of this year, that we would see ourselves as people who radically trust you and your plans, and that you're orchestrating them even now. May we not fall back into slander or gossip or insubordination. May those things be far from us. Lord, we believe that you are the ultimate authority, so we want to live our lives in ways that please you and glorify you and make much of you. And if you want us to submit to politics and to politicians and governing authorities, then we will. Oh, give us grace to do it. Give us grace when the squeeze comes and it's hard or harder. I pray for us as a body that we would be known for our love, that we would be known for our unity in the middle of a tumultuous political year that we would not rally around our politics, but we would rally around our God. We would rally around you. Give us grace to do that. Give us grace to, to kindly and lovingly engage this time of year, but to also stay above the fray and that we know you have bigger purposes. Don't let us forget that we are to be growing in our holiness even in the middle of difficult political seasons. Thank you, God. Thank you for your grace in allowing us to gather this morning. We pray that you are honored now as we sing to you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.